Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another art stream with myself, Pharaoh, and uh, my co-host this evening, Alexander Adams and Panama Hat. Hi, guys. Hiya. Um, diversity is our strength, I mean. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. I love the nation of Israel. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Thank you for oh, these. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think maybe before we say anything more, we should make clear that if we say anything complimentary about any of the art following, this is not an endorsement of the ideology or its uh, implications. No, no. Exactly. This is this is a purely negative critique. I myself, as a Trotskyite, uh, deplore <laughs> um, everything that we're about to see, especially if if you're a YouTube moderator, please be lenient. Um, okay, mm -hmm. let's um, talk about what we're looking at tonight. We're going to look at the, I, I've kind of quaintly called it the, the art of darkness, but it's all, the, the kind of concept behind it was uh, Panama in a previous stream mentioned around the, um, the art of um, you know, basically Hitler and dictatorship. And the interesting fact that personal collections often different, uh, differentiated themselves from private collections, the, the way that these dictators um, kind of showed themselves was often uh, kind of interesting as well. So that's kind of the broad topic, and we're going to be, going to be covering off a few interesting areas tonight. Um, but Alex, I don't know if you want to kind of kick, kick, kick us off and um, maybe kind of set the scene a little bit, but we, we will be f focusing on... I guess kind of the kind of mid, mid so-called mid-century period um, as kind of the kind of initial place to to touch upon. But uh, yeah, over to you, Alex. All right. Well, thanks, Pharaoh. Um, yeah. So obviously, we have to think about fascism as uh, being quite divergent. I know there's the the, the notoriously unreliable uh, essay by Umberto Eco who sort of had all the different criteria for fascism. So, I mean, we're, we're going to be fairly wide. We're not, we're not going to sort of go too much into depth into the ideology uh, per se. So you've obviously, you've got the Italian fascism, you have German fascism. It's, a, it's kind of a moot point as to whether or not Franco can be considered um, a fascist. Uh, I mean, that's kind of a, a big subject, which I, I'm not sure I could speak on, but um, it's certainly a traditionalist, certainly uh, very pro-Catholic. There's the Ustasi regime in Croatia. Uh, there was a brief, um, there was a brief uprising in, uh, I've forgotten, it's, well, it's one of the, the tiny little republics uh, on the uh, Dalmatian coast that was previously Italian. And the name is, is it Fiume or something? Okay. Yeah, I think Fiume. <laughs> Um, and then obviously you've got sort of uh, the quizzling regime, quizzling regimes, and so forth. But when we're principally going to be talking about uh, Germany and Italy. Um, yes, yeah. so, oh, go on. Yeah, because I guess they're kind of both, um, you know, you know, very well established. While you know some of the kind of smaller guys, uh, you know, wouldn't have had the power or the kind of longevity to you kind of build up, um, you know, kind of an. Uh, like an artistic base, but interestingly, both the Germans and the Italians placed art and culture at the heart of their kind of reinterpretation of their nations at the same time. And they're both quite divergent as well, you know, um, the Germanic perspective compared to the Italian. So I, I think it's a fascinating time to see um, with kind of a complete new government and way, in, way, way of thinking about a nation, how they realised um, that culture was super important for the shaping and formation of that and how they controlled it as well. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and and you've also got to remember that when the, um, the Italian fascists came in in the early 20s, they were, of course, looking at the template of the Bolsheviks in um, 1917. Um, so they were looking at the Bolsheviks as both a sort of a competition and also a sort of a template that they could follow because the Bolsheviks had done something very similar with art. As we've talked previously on um, the political art stream, um, we, we talked about the, uh, the control, the totalitarian control of the arts and the way things changed. So when the Bolsheviks came in, they were very radical, very extreme. They were um, embraced modernism, they embraced uh, constructivism, uh, Cubo futurism, and so forth. And then you, later on, you get more. It becomes more conservative. It becomes socialist realism, and then you get sort of heroic realism from the Stalinist period, and so forth. 
Um, you don't see that change so much in the fascist regimes, the two principal fascist regimes, principally because they're, as Ferro said, they're not around for very long. The Italians are there from the early 20s until 1940, what was it, 44, when Mussolini was removed. And then, was it, was it 44? I think it was 43, um, he gets overthrown, and then he has the Republic in the North um, until the end of the war. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so that's right. So it's 43, and then he's kind of like, he's a sort of a puppet regime for, um, yeah, for sort of uh, the remainder of the war. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, Hitler's obviously is uh, 1933 until 1945. And there were lots of plans, there were lots of ideas. Uh, not all of them got implemented, obviously. From 1939 onwards, you've got this sort of the war economy and you've got the war uh, targets, so which obviously diverts... Um, uh, money and materials and uh, manpower away from art projects and even away from architecture uh, into the war effort. So that's uh, so that obviously cuts short what was planned. Although we do have some interesting um, uh, buildings and artwork, um, principally painting, of course, uh, because it involves far less uh, material cost. It's obviously made by one man uh, mm. in each case. Um, generally, unless it's, of course, it's a mon monumental work. So you get these do actually reach fruition. Uh, so anyway, there's, there's different characters uh, to the two regimes, uh, artistic taste. So the Italians were quite relaxed. Um, they wanted art that was nationalistic in character. It was sort of um, referred back to uh, the traditions of uh, Italian art. Um, but they were not particularly strict about um, what form that took, as long as it was relatively traditional and recognisable. It wasn't, couldn't be abstract art, for for example. Um, totalitarian totalitarian um, regimes always hate abstract art, so you find that on the left and the right, um, because they think of art in terms of uh, its utilitarian value. So mm -hmm. you're going to you're going to lose constructivism. Um, however much the constructivists wanted to be uh, play a part in the creation of uh, Soviet man, this was not going to happen because uh, Lenin was not in for it and Stalin was definitely not. Um, so abstract art is out. Um, the Italians um, were slightly more modernist uh, in their um, outlook. Uh, also remember that uh, Mussolini was, um, was an avowed socialist communist to begin with, and he saw fascism as an extension of uh, the next stage of, um, it was sort of um, communism implemented through corporate um, control. So the centrally directed capitalist economy that would achieve socialist goals, which was a uh, bit of a mess, but he, obviously this is far much, much more left wing than um, Hitler, um, which was, um, and and also you've got to remember that uh, the Italian fascism didn't have a racial characteristic until 1938, when they had the official alliance with Hitler. And then Hitler said, you know, one of the conditions for riding in on our coattails is that you must implement um, restrictions on Jews. Yeah, well, so they, they kind of ex exported. But it's, it's relatively late there. I think that's interesting. Just going, yeah, to, going back to the, the, the socialist point, I think I, I think we just need to keep that in our heads all the way through the Italian stuff because certainly the kind of more municipal art, um, in, in my mind, it just reeks of, uh, yeah, like, you know, um, Soviet, um, you know, kind of, collectivist you know we the people uh art so i think it's, it's interesting that there's that, that kind of that kind of leanings one, one other thing i would say is that you know i i think we do underestimate how long uh Mussolini was around for um you know like what's that is that about 25 25 years yeah um yeah. roughly roughly 20 i think in italian they call it they they refer to that period as the the 20 years um that's what they mean by that you know yeah so, so it's, it's it's like I, I think we often think of um you know fascism as that kind of flash in the pan german reaction to weimar blah 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 but actually you know that certainly the italian side is much more um or, organically grown and i think because of that I, I think it's interesting how they develop some of their kind of artistic um kind of frameworks and structures but we'll, we'll, i guess we'll go into that more more in a bit but um sorry sorry alex carry on 
No, no, that's great. I think that's a great way to summarize, uh, summarize the Italian position. So the Italian position is basically, it's not racially di um, driven. It's, uh, it's, it's stylistically relatively broad, although it's um, largely anti-modernist. Although they are modernist, uh, you'll find that all of regimes are actually quite modernist in terms of their relations to city planning and also to do with technology and to do with architecture. Painting, they can afford to have it sort of all rustic, but um, when it comes to uh, planes and uh, airports and railway systems, then they're, they're definitely not going rustic at all on that. Um, so the character of German art is more, uh, under Hitler, is more, it's definitely more nationalistic. It's uh, it's much more conservative in terms of style. It's more conservative in terms of subject. Uh, it's racially motivated, so you've got uh, prohibitions on Jews exhibiting um, and, and belonging to professional bodies uh, quite early on. Uh, they also extend that to Austria. Well, of course, Austria, they annexed in 1938, so this came in quite heavily. Lots of Jewish artists in um, Vienna, in particular, um, so this hits them very heavily. So you see sort of a, like a, a mass wave of um, people uh, either leaving or going underground. Um, um, what else can we say about? Um, oh yes, so also there's this struggle. Uh, you're going to see this struggle inside the the Nazi attitude towards art in that you're going to have some people who are strict uh, conservatives, they're traditionalists, they're mainly from the south, they're interested in the Biedermeier school, which is the Austrian school, which is quite sort of traditional, very heavy, quite ornate, a little bit sentimental, um, actually quite banal. Um, but then you're also going to see a no more northern German uh, strain, which is Nordic, and that's uh, much more tied in with uh, expressionism and modernism and having um, the idea of blood and soil, which was um, essentially that um, uh, the, 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 the land forms the people and the people own the land. And that there's a direct correlation between that and the art that the people produce for their nation. So there is a direct mm. connection between the soil and the landscape and the terrain and the art that's produced. Yeah, I, I guess it's all that kind of the, the Volk. You have the kind of Volk movement, and you like Volk museums and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and just just on the Germans again, I, th I think we often so sign off, write off, sorry, um, uh, fa fascist Germany art as this kind, of, like you said, very kind of like sentimental and um, you know ped pedantic art. But there is definitely more complexity to it than than is typically appreciated. So I mean, hopefully tonight will be exposing some of the uh um you know like, like like i think one of the aims for tonight was just to kind of approach this from just like a purely value-free perspective because all of the things i read around this had um an objective in the kind of way they were treating it which was basically to portray you know th these people as bad and obviously uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying they're not bad but more like they're not trying to analyze the art from a purely aesthetic p position so um yeah um, Anything else to say, Alex, before we kind of get cracking with some, uh, some art? Yeah, I, I would say, um, I think um, maybe you could say that the Italian art is much more positive because they're sort of, uh, they're more keen on what they're aiming for. The German approach is much more negative. They're much more focused on what they don't want and, much what, and what they are hostile towards. Um, so... I have I have a couple of quotes from Hitler. Should I? <laughs> I mean, these are from art textbooks, by the way. Not not referring to sort of incendiary sort of racial aspects, but this is, this his, is from um, Alexander's personal copy of Mein Kampf. That we're reading from here. <laughs> I was going to say when you mentioned about struggle earlier, there was a definite there's a joke in there somewhere. But uh... well, yes, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So I think I've, um, I I'm going to read read you two quotes. Um, which is uh, which occurred on the occasion of the opening of, um, we'll get to this, but there's basically in 1937, they inaugurate um, uh, uh, the, the Haus der Kunst in Munich, um, which is um, essentially, it's the sort of the, the, a new national gallery for a new national art. 
and uh, Hitler gives a speech on this and it's basically he spends much more time talking about the sort of art that he hates and the sort of art that he has to he is is endeavoring to combat and to to extinguish rather than the art that he actually likes um so which i think is quite telling so i'll, I'll read you two um relatively short um quotes because i think it uh, it explains what happens oh because uh, also in 1937 there are two major exhibitions in Germany, and one of them is of uh, this sort of national art, the new national art, so new German art. And then the other one, of course, is the most famous one, which is the Degenerate Art Show, the Entarte der Kunst um, exhibition. Um, and that is of all the art that is condemned. And obviously, we're going to discuss discuss this uh, division at, at length in this uh, discussion. So anyway, I'm going to give you two quotes. Uh, so this is Hitler speaking in 1937 at the opening of the German art show. So at first he talks about the link between art and um, people. And he says, um, on the other hand, its relation uh, relationship to time, so we're talking about art, its relationship to time was stressed. That is, there was no longer any art of peoples or even of races. So he's talking about the um, the sort of uh, the degeneration as he sees it um, of uh, from the high art of the Renaissance and the Gothic uh, down to modern times. There was no longer any art of peoples or even of races, but only an art of the times. According to this theory, therefore, Greek art was not formed by the Greeks, but by a certain period which formed it as their expression. The same naturally was true of Roman art, which for the same reasons coincided only by accident with the rise of the Roman Empire. Uh, then he talks about this in, uh, um, in relation to other nations. So consequently, art as such was not only completely isolated from its ethnic origins, but it is the expression of a certain vintage, which is characterized today by the word modern, and thus, of course, will be unmodern tomorrow since it will be outdated. According to such a theory, as a matter of fact, art and art, art activities are lumped together with the handiwork of our modern tailor shops and fashion industries. To be sure, following the maxim, every year something new. One day Impressionism, then Futurism, Cubism, maybe even Dadaism, etc. A further result is that for even the most insane and inane monstrosities, thousands of catchwords to label them will have to be found and have indeed been found. If it weren't so sad in one sense, it would be also it be almost be a lot of fun to list all the slogans and cliches with which the so-called art initiates have described and explained their wretched products in recent years. Then he goes on to mention about what he wants. Until the moment when national socialism took power, there existed in Germany a so-called modern art, that is, to be sure, almost every year another one, as the very meaning of this word indicates. National socialist Germany, however, once again a German art, and this art shall and will be of eternal value, as are all creative values of a people. And... There's a very, um, so, and then he, he goes on to explain a little bit later what he wants, what he thinks um, the art should be. Um, so art can in no way be a fashion, as little, of, as little as the character and the blood of our people will change, so much will art have to lose its mortal character and replace it with worthy images expressing the life force of our people in the steadily unfolding growth of its creations. Cubism, Dadaism, Futurism, Impressionism, etc., have nothing to do with our German people. For these concepts are neither old nor modern, but are only the artifactitious stammerings of men to whom God has denied the grace of a truly artistic talent, and in its place has awarded them the gift of jabbering or deception. I will therefore confess now, in this very hour that I have come to the final inalterable decision to clean house, just as I have done in the domain of political confusion, and from now on, and from now on, rid the German art life of its phrase mongering. So there you are. So that's what the <laughs> Nazis were talking about um, in terms of art. It's, it's, it's interesting. Again, he's picked up on some like what I think are very important points. This kind of um, kind of post romantic um, focus on um, uh, again these kind of fashion cycles, you know, this kind of the need for creativity and originality, and how that is 
you know, <laughs> sort of uh, self-perpetuating in some ways. But, um, you know, and, and I think there's something, you know, in, in, in hindsight, you can see that there is some truth, truth to that. But then his mm. reaction, re- reaction to that is to basically say, we need to create this, you know, the idea of a national, a national style, which I think is very interesting. And it, there is a focus in the 19th century as well about this, you know, can you create a national style? But would a Renaissance artist really think they're creating as p- something as part of a national style? I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure they would do. No. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting that he, I think he has some diagnosis slightly correct, but then he's, I mean, um, yeah. Well, I, I, I do think he made a very interesting point about how, um, you get these you get these periods where all these various new styles are being put forward and then within a week they're sort of you know out of date and and they sort of are like because they attempt to catch up with with sort of the, the day ahead of them they very quickly fall behind I mean like I mean you you get movements like sort of Dadaism which I would say kind of even though it it kind of uh, pitted out as an, as an official movement, I think the spirit of it has sort of carried through the ages. Um, whereas, say, you go to the late 90s with the, you know, um, conceptualists or whatever, you know, it's sort of like they're, they're so of a particular moment in time that 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 it's very, it's hard for that movement to continue itself and perpetuate, you know. I, I, I think I think what, what Hitler was saying there does have some merit. And I'll be clipping that later. For uh, I'm toast now. And... I've, I've quoted Hitler on on YouTube, so I'm toast now because <laughs> yeah. I don't have a channel to lose. I, I, so I think it's, it's it's very very interesting that Hitler taps into the, a, a general resentment and suspicion of modernity, yeah, uh, as 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 a, as a driving force for unification and um, something to seize on that they can oppose. Because mm. I think that there was a general alarm. Um, you, I mean, what you see is there's, there's a, a big struggle between the Bauhaus and the Nazis, because what happens is the Bauhaus, which is the modernist, pro-abstract, pro-constructivist um, uh, art school, is founded in, I think, 1919. Mm. Um, and, and it and it, during its lifespan, uh, because it ended, it ended in 1933 for very obvious reasons. It, it actually, it actually um, was based in three different cities. And what would happen was they would set up in a city. The Nazis would be elected regionally, and they would cut funding, and so they would be forced to move. And so, in their last move, they were in Berlin, which is the, the most red, you know, most mm-hmm. right, uh, left-wing city part Babylon, of Babylon, Berlin. Babylon, Berlin, indeed. Um, and so they ended up there, and then of course 1933 came, and they were sort of they were completely out. But it was the it was specifically things like the Bauhaus, which um, advocated uh, dress reform, which refer, uh, which talked about um, uh, gender gender equality, um, um, uh, androgyny, um, abstraction, modernism, uh, becoming interested in Eastern religion and so forth, which you see as a sort of a template for liberal um, well le- le- leftism. Uh, and this has obviously raised a lot of hackles and and made conservatives quite suspicious. And this is something that Hitler himself could tap into. Mm. Yes, it's it's yeah, no, it's, it's interesting how he's kind of used that um, kind of natural negativity to then sort of mould the discourse off off the off the back of it. Um, it there's also something kind of like non elitist about it. It's kind of like um, imagine you took. The typical Greg's uh, customer down to Tate Modern and asked him what he thought of the art, and he'll say it's a bunch of rubbish or whatever. Um, and he's sort of channeling into that. I, I, that's, that's, that was the kind of like the you know all like big big Greg energy that kind of. But in but in Tate but in Tate Britain he could see the pre Raphaelites and he'd say oh that's that's really pretty. Yeah, yeah you know it, yeah it, it, exactly yeah I, I think that when it comes to kind of. Uh, on the plebeian level, there, there has to be that kind of skill um, ceiling, I suppose. There, there has to be this mm. this this idea that, well, I couldn't have, have have done that, so you know, therefore, it's talented and it needs to be here. I think. Um, and I also, I this is kind of less related to art, but I, I found it interesting how Hitler phrased that 
that thing that he he had cleared up the political confusion in <laughs> in, in his country. Yeah. Now, I think that it's it's you 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 kind of see how this guy worked uh, and sort of managed for, for 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 as long as he did. I mean, when you look at what Germany was prior to sort of all through the Weimar period, and then you look at the Nazi period. I mean he kind of did clear up the confusion because now there's just one party, you know? And even even if even if you were a German person who wasn't a Hitlerite, you can probably see some value in an end to the sort of chaotic mess of 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 uh, of, of the of the pre Nazi period with, you know, this this party and that party fighting each other in the streets for to win like a couple of seats in some provincial town, you know, like it's it's it, the the way he phrases it is 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 effective rhetorically um i think is is the most fascinating thing and and all it also applies to how he, that he's saying well now we're going to do the same thing with art so for your average kind of german listening to this this is going to have great impact isn't it because it's like well he's he was he was right about that he must be right about this yeah and, and also remember that he's saying this in munich which is the heart of mm. uh, the nazi movement um, so it's Austria and Bavaria are really strongly pro-Nazi. The northern areas are less um, are less um, Nazi, but yeah, I mean this more, is this is the sort Catholic. of the cultural centre. Mm. Okay, cool. So should we dive into some arts, maybe? Yep. Yes. Give them some visuals. Mm. So where, where where do we want to start first? Uh, well, I think maybe we should start the maybe if we start with um, the Italian stuff, and we'll just see how far we get. Okay. Do you, okay. Should we load up your your little selection? Hang on a second. Oh, hi, hi to the chat. By the way, so hi to Years and hi to Rayan. Um, so feel free to send us some uh, send us some messages, and we'll and if they come up um, in time, we'll try and discuss them as they come up. Yeah, so uh, this is, dun, dun, dun. yeah, so this is um, Enigma of the Hour. This is 1911, a painting made by Giorgio de Chirico. Giorgio de Chirico was uh, an Italian metaphysical painter, uh, an Italian, hello to you guys. Uh, so he was an Italian born in Greece. Um, I think his, his father worked on the railways in Greece and he went to study in Munich. Um, and he was doing a lot of reading of Nietzsche. Um, so he's reading Nietzsche. Uh, he was uh, interested in Brooklyn, Arnold Brooklyn, which um, who comes up in the art of symbolism, I think, and probably second part, maybe. I can't remember. Anyway, have, have a look at all the parts. They're all good. <laughs> um, but anyway, so in, in 1910, he invents um, metaphysical art with his brother. His brother, his brother, Alberto, is professionally known as Alberto Salvino, um, who was uh, a writer, a painter, and a composer. Uh, Giorgio de Chirico himself was born in 1888, uh, born in Greece, uh, educated in uh, Munich, uh, speaks Italian and French, very well educated, a uh, very interesting man. So when he's still a young man, he um, shakes off the influence of Bolklin, and in 1910 begins this uh, metaphysical art, which is um, basically him embracing his Italian heritage. So he starts painting these piazzas and these arcades. So these are all invented, but they're sort of inspired by uh, the Italian uh, Renaissance. I was going to say, this is very much like the like Florentine... Yeah, like yeah, plazas and stuff, isn't it? With the kind of arch, the Roman arches. So. Well, well, exactly, because um, he actually invented metaphysical art while he was in Florence. Okay, <laughs> so well, well, well spotted. Um, yeah, so so here we have uh, this is an architectural. Um, so this is a painting of one of his invented architectures, architectural scenes. So his art is characterized by these sort of lone figures uh, in the distance. So you're never sure of their identity. There's no particular narrative. Uh, it, it's um, often set at twilight, so you have the melancholy of twilight. You have the golden light. You have the the air turning the sky into sort of greens and sort of 
dark blues and sort of um, very curious colors. And so anyway, this is one of his one of his invented cityscapes. Uh, now, um, De Chirico's relationship with fascism is kind of a bit ambiguous. He, I'm not sure how political he was, but he did in, nine, in 1930, I think it's 32, he wrote a letter to Mussolini and he was sort of saying that basically he was in favor of um, fascism and he was in favor of um, fascistic art because it was a because it was something like it was an extension of the Italian tradition. So it wasn't it wasn't that um, he I think it was that he saw fascism as a nat as a natural progression of a reassertion of Italian values uh, rather than sort of anti-Bolshevism or anti-Jewish influence or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, and I think that kind of emphasis on Italian values is super important when understanding the kind of Italian version of fa uh, fascism because um, th there is an almost kind of classical streak <laughs> running quite quite the way through it, and we'll see this time and time time again where they're looking to um, you know certainly idealised versions of the past to inject directly inside like like. Uh, <laughs> I would describe the difference between this and the Germanic idea as um, the kind of the Italians took some of these classical notions, but then sort of modernized it and grew from it. While the Germans tend to take it more on face value, they'll kind of adopt the Gothic font again or something like that. Something yeah. quite um, return. Um, yeah, it, it, they're much more like return. While the, the Italians are kind of like, how do we create something new? But I, pulling it yeah. from our past. I, I, I do think that in that respect, the Italian fascism is much more uh, worthy of kind of praise because, you know, like, I think not to me, Nazism is, is, is basically this kind of massive calamity. You know, it's this huge, almost comedy of, of errors and kind of self, self hatred and self sort of destruction. And, and, and they, they, they never really, they well, they never at all really. I think put together a kind of coherent artistic vision. You know, I, I think on when we look at it in 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 hindsight, they barely put together a coherent uh, political uh, vision. So I mean, but the the Italians have this whole kind of idea of regeneration, and you know, let's let's take things let's take things forward. You know, let's uh, let's let's sort of. Um, as you say, work out what what we can build anew in the ruins of the world that was just torn down in the First World War. Um, and I think some something else to note is, of course, the date on this painting is 1911, and a lot of people seem seem to think that it was all romanticism. And then once you get to 1918, 1920, it all just it all just sort of explodes into into modernism, which of course this isn't true. Um, and it's quite clear that. A lot of the avant-garde artistic movements were around, sort of um, that that the we would come to sort of recognize as like twenties modernism. Were around they 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 had their origins in the sort of late eighteen nineties, and they sort of moved through that period. You know, um, I mean, in in literature, you have um, Ezra Pound in London in 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 nineteen oh eight. You know, and the the um, vorticists in in nineteen. 14 and the reason that, that that movement fails is because of the war because half of them all get sent sent off to the trenches um so you know there's um I, I think it's just interesting to examine the way things were headed before the first world war um as opposed to, to just seeing it as a kind of uh you know straightforward uh sort of causal event in in modern art <laughs> Yeah, I, I would also say um, there's actually there's the <clears throat> what you ha ha what you find is with the futurists. The futurists were Italians who were very much in favour of um, uh, fascism. Well, sort of of, of war, um, and they were sort of started in sort of uh, 1911 or something about mm -hmm. the time that this picture was painted. But they are very much Cubist, They're very very um, uh, aggressive modernists, and then. After the after the First World War in 1918, most of them turned to conservatism. They turned to sort of uh, 
um, uh, regional subjects, they turn to still lives, they turn to portraits, they turn their back on modernism. So actually they, they see that the, the First World War as, as a catastrophe, so of a catastrophe caused by modernism. And so they turn their backs and they want something more traditional, which, and I think that these are, of course, the, this is the idea, this is the ideal um, uh, ground um, sort of uh, soil for fascism, Italian fascism to grow in. So in that they are former modernists, but they are strongly nationalistic, they're strongly regionalistic, and they want a, a return to order. So obviously they're, 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 they're the perfect constituency for fascism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if we go to the next image, um, this is, uh, yeah, so this is uh, one of the um, ca uh, Casa del Fascio, uh, the House of Fascism, um, <laughs> built in the 1930s by Carino de Giorgio. So this is not Giorgio de Chirico, but this is Carino de Giorgio, who was an Italian architect. And have a look at just have a look at that architecture does that remind you of anything well i was literally i literally switched between the two to have a little double take between how close it was that's very interesting yeah mm. yeah so this is a purely invented architect by de chirico in 1911 becomes massively successful in italy and paris the irony is that by the 1930s de chirico himself the painter is a traditionalist and he's abandoned this style. He's painting <laughs> portraits and still lives and sort of horses galloping across beaches and so forth. And <laughs> he has influenced a generation of architects who come up and produce architecture, which is essentially based on his paintings. Mm. So the, the, arch the architecture of fascism is a blend of, as we've said, it's a blend of modernism and traditionalism. It's regional in character, it's regional in its materials, but it's often quite strikingly modernist. So it's using colonnades and so forth. But of course, it's got sort of um, peculiarities about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, look, I mean, the, the, the wonderful thing, of course, is that I, I wouldn't say it was internationalist. You know, as I think, as you said, this yeah, is kind yeah. of, this, this is an Italian building we're looking at um quite recognizably um, just in terms of it's like raw structure it's sort of reminiscent of a church actually like the early basilicas with mm. no um with, with no well basically you could say that the, this externality here is like an an aisle on the side which has been um yeah made external and you've got the kind of narthex at the front but because because if you go to some of the kind of very early um roman churches they have a lot more of this kind of brick facing structure to it, unadorned, very simple mm. on the outside. So again, it, this is actually quite a traditional building in terms mm. of its, its structure, but then you've got things like the kind of um, abstractified, um, you know, Romanesque um, arches here. And, and again, just like there's just no ornamentation mm. whatsoever. No, and there's no, there's no stucco as well. So this is yeah. bare brick. Exactly. And, and then, whatever this thing here is, it's almost like a weird bell tower, but again, mm. it, it, there is that kind of projecting nature of it, which again, again, uh, it just makes but me the, think of future, futurism and energy and going into the, but, 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 the but also, But also think of de Chirico, because de Chirico has all sorts of built, all, all sorts of um, inexplicable uh, brick structures with these sort of um, arches that are kind of useless and impossible and fantastical. And yet here it is, it's been built in reality. Mm. That's and great. the next, the, the next one, I think, is just another, another, uh, another Casa del Fascio, which which were built um, all across Italy. I think that they were um, there was something to do with the party. Maybe they were party headquarters, or maybe they were sort of community centres or so on. Uh, some of them are still standing. Um, I saw one that was uh, being converted into a bowling alley, which is a little bit sad. <laughs> but I guess yeah. it's better to have it used than not used. I'm actually yeah. reviewing a book called uh, Carino de Giorgio, an artist, an architect's legacy, and that review will be going up on my website, um, which is alexanderadamsart.wordpress.com, uh, in the next uh, week or two. So you'll be able to see my discussion of um, uh, this architect. Also, if, you, if you're listening and you haven't checked out that website, you, you must do. It is uh, a cornucopia of knowledge and information it's very good can, it is very good you cannot find anywhere else on the internet that quality that quality just going back to the, build, the build, building a second this is almost something palladian about it. it's like a, a you know palladian um 
semi semi crescent. You can see there's a bit of relief work in the top. And again, so again, I, I think it's really interesting how they kind of bring in some traditional modes in with the kind of modern, modern stylings. Mm. Yeah, uh, and and yet, of course, it's and yet it's also relatively vernacular. It's not it's not ecclesiastical. It's yeah. not it's not strictly speaking civic, um, although it performs a civic function. Uh, the the style is is more sort of vernacular, um, I, and I, I and this is actually quite uh, quite appealing. Uh, also, 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 if you've ever visited uh, Bologna, you'll recognise that the um, the arcade, the the sort of the pillared arcades, uh, walkways uh, are very common in the centre of the city. Mm. Interesting. But there is actually something almost like this you, you get in the UK and um, Norway. If, if you've ever been to Oslo's ta town hall. Um, again, the, the 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 Nordic style in the in interwar period uses a lot of these kind of bricks, but they also have these kind of like large, um, like secular buildings, but like project like thinking about kind of bigger bigger things basically. Like you, you sort you sort of see it around town halls, like interwar town halls in England as well, where they'll have kind of like sculpture of here is the working man bettering himself, or, or, or you know something similar. So it's, it's interesting to see that. You know, I don't think there's much difference between this as a building and, uh, you know, if you go to a town like, like a town hall in London, you'll 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 see kind of like relief work on a, on a brick building where they've got kind of like depictions of, um, yeah, the you know, the, civic the, the virtues. People. Yeah, exactly, civic virtues of the people working together, which is probably the same thing that would be depicted here as well. So, hmm. yeah. So if you go on to the next one. So this is the Palazzo della uh, Civiletta uh, Italiana uh, in Rome, created in 1942. So this is right at the right at the end. So this is mm. obviously um, <laughs> it's it's um, it's obviously referring to classical um, art, uh, ca classical forms of architecture. But of course, it's a, it's got a, it's it's in <laughs> it's an insane. It's kind of it's an insane thing. It looks sort of half. It looks like sort of a Roman multi-story car park. <laughs> that's, a, that's a perfect way to describe oh, right, that yeah. building. I think that's a little bit a little bit harsh. I, I, I okay. always had a soft soft spot for this uh, uh, building. Um, yeah. So so this is so this is uh, so it's using some classical forms, but it using it's using um, some. I think I think this is just stonework. It might it might actually just be stonework. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I there, there might, there might, there might not be a, um, a, a sort of a good um, structure underneath. Yeah, um, just architecturally, just check out, check out some of the vaulting though. It's it's mm. it's vaulting on the on, on the inside, which is which is lovely. So what 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 I think is clever about it is you have again the the idea of the kind of Roman um, uh, like row row of co columns basically. But then um, what they've done is they've put it into a totally new format. Look at this, um, you know, kind of. Is it, I wonder if it is a is a cube. Do you know if it, if it is a cube or is it? I a, a think I think it is. I think it is a cube. Okay. Um. um but um. But, but again, and that's distinctly non Romanesque, isn't it? You know, the, the, you wouldn't have that kind of um kind of flat roof, and also the number of stories is way too high as well. So, again, it's sort of subverting some of those kind of Roman elements. You've also got the kind of the arches being used as niches, which is kind of clever. But the Romans would place their sculptures on the top of the buildings as opposed to the bottom um, sometimes. But uh, certainly for civic buildings, etc., you, you, you're kind of used to the pediment at the top. But instead of the pediment, you're kind of greeted with this kind of uh, I don't I don't know what it translates as, but I guess it's some kind of fascist. Oh, it's a, the, pa the pa palace of um, Ita Italian sort of civil of. Uh, Italian uh, civil uh, civil society, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just looking to see if there is. Ah, okay. Right. I've got a. I've got a better image for you. Um, I can't. And, uh, I'll. Okay. I'll send it through. Dun, dun, dun. I can stop sharing. Hold on a second. I'll, I'll just send it. Send it. Send it over private chat. I'll just get yeah. it now. So, so do, you, do you know the story about this area at all? Do you want to find? I can talk a little uh, no, bit no, you, you go ahead. I think you know more about it than I do. Um, so basically, um, like you said, towards the end of um, the kind of uh, fascist period, 
uh, Mussolini planned an entire new exhibition space slash um, um, like like civic civic area. Okay, there, there's your much nicer photo. But see, I, th I think there's it just predates a lot of stuff in the '60s. There's a brutalist angle to it as well. I think it's mm. a very forward forward looking building. Um, in, in, in the, many the, ways. I mean, the, the shape of it is extremely clean. I mean, you've got sort of no uh, no architraves or anything like that. No. It, yeah, it's kind of no like lintels. if, if Pleiadianism Pleiadianism was taken up to the next level. Um, mm. You know, you you have platonic. Like it's sort of platonic Pleiadianism. <laughs> yes, yeah, that, that's that's true. Um, I, I mean, you have got this kind of like pretty. I'll just call them quaint. Um, sculptural forms though across it but um interestingly this that that building is all part of um this kind of little area here which which has got a long italian name which was kind of shortened to eur which i will just call uh <laughs> for, for the rest of this conversation <laughs> but um basically you, you've got um i think i've got a plan of what it originally looked like um so the whole idea of this it was going to be this international um exhibition space to kind of show how awesome uh, fascism is and they had a series of buildings created as part of that and uh, that, that was you can see it across here as, as one of them um, but interestingly it's kind of like the first kind of um, like it, it sort of reminds me of, of like the South Bank or something like that it's a pre-planned <laughs> um, mm. group of ideological art buildings uh, there's nothing like it I, I can think of um, I mean in fact there, there is you know how the the Germans tried to plan that entire city out in, in like a mega mega classical style. I can't remember. The yes, yeah, I think I think mm. we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, so that's Germania. Yeah. It, yes, exactly. But they never managed to actually even build a single building. The Italians managed to get quite a few of them up, and um, you know, I, I think there's a quite impressive suite. So his um, his, his another is like a, like a, a crescent. Um, mm. We've got uh, yeah. Palace of uh, Congress, but again, they've tried to kind of use a very simplified um, mosaic motif on the floor across here. This is straight out. This uh, is a, I'm not sorry. such a fan of these ones. I mean, the the um, Civic Palace, I think, had a kind of uh, very very aesthetic blend of the um, uh, sort of ancient Roman style, um, and you know, you, you've got as you mentioned the figures there. Um, and I and it's one of the first time. I mean, I presume would would it be correct to call that plate glass on the inside? Um, yeah, it's it's I'm the first sure, time. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, sure, I'm not sure if it's. I'm not sure if that's original. The glass, if I'm honest with you. But um, ah, okay. Um, well, if 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 it is, then I'd say it's the first time I've seen sort of plate glass in something. Then I think that it looks sort of good. You know, it 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 suits the style of the building, and I think it helps also that there's a clear skyline. Uh, around around the building, I think that's very important, you know, because a lot of the time these things will just be sort of crammed so tightly um, into urban areas that that you don't really have a chance to appreciate, uh, I suppose, the sweep of them. Um, I know it sounds quite sort of abstract, but I, I do think it's important, you know. Um, you know, you, you see beautiful things just sort of cobbled up in 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 sort of tight spaces where they you just don't get the the full sense of them, I think. Whereas with this, you do. Um, the, with, but yeah, with, with the other two, I'm not such a fan. Yeah, and, and you can see the scale from the people across here. I mean, this is a pretty monumental building, and um, I, I really love the impressive staircase going up. But at the same mm -hmm. time, there is something almost um, out of kind of early Florentine Renaissance as well, where you have there's there's a lot of these kind of uh, like um, I wouldn't call them architectural paintings, but architecture is an important part of um, the background. Where you'll have kind of like um, a, a scene of three, um, three, three people, or again like I'd know Mary in the centre and then two saints either side. But you can see they've tried to keep some of that. I feel I feel like, but the building has become the um, the replacement for Mary, which again in my mind, you know, goes ties in really well with the fascist ideology of the state being, you know, almost a replacement for God. You know, mm -hmm. so it's kind of like the the vision of Mary here has been totally um subverted at the same time but yeah I, th I think definitely that's one of the, the the better the better buildings there is some interesting um relief relief work um which is, which I, in some ways is very very cringe but it's kind of interesting just from a historical perspective but um I, i'm sure you've seen trajan's column where you've got kind of got mm -hmm. a, a kind of a, a wrap a wrap around low relief 
um, story of um, uh, Trojan sort of triumphs, wasn't it? Yeah, over over Dacia, you know, Trajan smashing, truth regime. Yeah, exactly, like smashing the, the Romanians to pieces, basically. Um, but um, they do something similar here, where you've kind of got the history of, uh, well, as they see it, the history of fascism. So you can see, uh, you know, Imperial Rome form across here. Um, you know, this is, <laughs> you know, maybe appropriately for them that, you know, this is uh, who um, sacks the temple. I'm trying to remember. Is it, is it Hadrian? I'm not sure. Yeah, I th- um, it may be Vespasian. Um, okay. So I might be yeah. wrong. It could be Hadrian. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're probably right. Where they kind of steal all the stuff from the uh, Jerusalem. Yeah, <laughs> and then you've then you've, got, then you've got kind of the um, the the medieval age across here. Here's the workers, and then look look who's here at the bottom. This cheeky oh, chap, the Duque oh, Benito. Um, I mean, he. I think I think it's worth pointing out now that because I mean, he appears in quite a lot of this art, and while I don't think he's as kind of I don't find him contemptible as I find Hitler contemptible in a sort of from a sort of reactionary point of view, but he's still this kind of very. Um, I mean, he. I, th- I think it's a good illustration of why ego-driven uh, sort of uh, personality cult worship isn't going to work in the long run, um, because he it, it it's impossible to really take this figure seriously now, and I, I know that you know. The Italians do love this sort of thing, you know. They love this sort of grandstanding machismo. Yeah, um, the, the strong. But I mean, yeah. I, I really do think for me the greatest flaw in Mussolini's regime is in its lack of Catholicism in such a deeply Catholic country. Um, you know, if you if if there was some way to kind of uh, flip all this um, personality cult sort of thing on its head and sort of return to a more sort of Christ-driven. Uh, style, then I think it would be much more interesting to look at um, in terms of what what you can do with the Christian truth in the modern world. Um, but that's just sort of just personally speaking. But but, but it's interesting, and I, and I think that there's obviously that kind of um, problem where you know if you're worshiping the state, if the, if the state is yeah uh, your love and your life, how can you uh, have any have anything else? And so. It's, but it's, it's interesting. Everything we've seen so far, you know, in, from a building perspective, hasn't shown any allusions to like Christianity at all. In fact, that what they're harking back to is a pre-Christian state as well. So again, I think there's, mm-hmm. there's interesting. Or again, like I was saying, with the kind of remo- the, re- the replacement of Mary, Mary within within that. Again, the, the, I guess you have got like a, a small little. Here's a tiny cross here, but uh, you know, well, use the big... I, I suppose the the implication is that is that these are all just like stages in the history of of the Italians, and that maybe you know maybe that's, yeah, that yeah. that you you can just transpose. You know, once you have Hadrian, then you have Christ, then you have Mussolini. You know, <laughs> yeah. Is this is this meant to be Garibaldi? Probably. Um, although I know he'll definitely be, be on there somewhere. Because it's um, interesting the, the the positioning, but like in terms of like art style, is this is in my opinion pretty terrible. But it's just interesting as like a piece of propaganda because it does look very similar to the to the the Trojan um, Tra- uh, Trojan's column style. Um, yeah, Alex, I don't know if you've got a comment on some of the some of this. Um, yeah, I would say that what what you find is you find that a lot of these buildings are still up there. Uh, and they're and they're still being used, um, and they've they've sort of you know like you'll find that Italian. Um, Italian sort of um, town halls and uh, police stations and so forth are still, um, still a lot of them come from the um, the fascist era, uh, and obviously the the bombing, the devastation, was not so serious initially compared to Germany, mm. and obviously there was more uh, the the fascist period was longer in Italy, so you you tend to find more of these buildings, uh, and I saw so I would also say one thing is that. Um, the idea of fascist architecture was that it was um, a, a large part of it. Not not the not the not the the early ones that I showed you, the Carino buildings, but these big buildings in um, in Rome were designed to intimidate and to impress. And um, later on, I mean, we might get to it in this session, or we may have to leave it until a later session. We'll also be looking at um, a couple of German um, fascist buildings. And the the important thing is the scale. The scale is supposed to be sort of superhuman. You, you know what? It's certainly. I, I would. Have, um, I think that's particularly so with the interiors as well. I should have put some in here. I may, maybe I'll have it next time. 
but I don't, I don't know if you've, you guys have ever seen um, the film The Conformist. No. Il, il, no. Il Conform, Conform, Confimesto. It's, a, it's about a, um Italian... Well, basically, it's like this Italian guy who sort of gets in with the, the fascists, but he's a bit of a you know, fair weather friend or whatever, but mm -hmm. it's um, stylistically, they kind of capture the es essence of Italian fascism so beautifully. And, and it has this kind of very dark, very wide, but kind of minimalist tone to it that is very imposing. Um, I may get some, maybe I'll get some pictures up in, in a bit of it. And, and that kind of exemplifies some of the interiors that we, and the kind of sense of space. And again, you know, like, this is very big. <laughs> you know, you're only you're yeah. only like at, at the height across there. So you're kind of straining to look up, um, even at the decay down at the bottom across there. So, um, um, I would uh, if, I would just ask: do, do either of you know how this stuff has been allowed to sort of remain um, up to the modern day, or, or why, for example, wasn't it sort of attacked in the years of lead, or you know, it, it, some some recent uh, you know attempts to take it down? It's, it's, it's still popular, I think. Interestingly. I, I, uh, but, but also, there, was, there wasn't. There wasn't. A, I don't think there was a period of denazification in um, yeah. Italy as there was in Germany. No, uh, like and it, it was wasn't. And it wasn't. And it was. I know it was sort of occupied, but it wasn't really sort of occupied. So it, it never had that sort of. Uh, that it never. It never became a sort of a ward well, of uh, the Allies. I mean, really, yeah, they they didn't do anything to Italy. I mean, up until the mid eighties, you still had like major fascist and communist parties competing against each other in elections and you know slaughtering each other in the streets you know it was they they kind of just carried on what they were doing uh, prior to that and also remember the the italians technically changed sides before the end of the war they did yeah because so they 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 changed over and it was actually the german it was the german occupiers in northern italy who were resisting the allies so the technically Republic. It, yeah so technically italy was an ally of the allied forces Mm -hmm. at the end of the war so it wasn't sort of occupied in that sense in the mm -hmm. way that um austria and germany were the enemy all the way up until the fact that the, uh, up until they were actually militarily defeated mm -hmm. um it just just to, just to kind of show how um you know certainly a lot of this period stays with people today berlusconi relatively recently said that uh, you know mussolini had several good points to him and that was, that, was only, that was only a couple of years ago. So you know, even today, I, I, I think certainly, you know, people can see a different. Uh, I think I think it's certainly a more nuanced character, and the movement is is, is uh, you know has less negative connotations in Italy today or whatever. Yeah, and I've also got... you also. I mean, as I said, Italian art is is more Italian fascism is more open. It's more positive. It's less. It's less aggressive. It's less negative. It's less less desire. It's le I was going to say it's less reactionary. I mean, it, it is reactionary, but, but it's reactionary in a different way. And also, the Italians have got the get out. Yeah, and of course, the Italians have got the get out that oh well, we never really did the con well. They had concentration camps, but they didn't have the death camps or anything. They like never. That. Yeah. So they, so they so they're able to say well, you know, look what we were doing was basically uh, populist nationalism and it was that Hitler who did all the bad stuff. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're not going to be taking down this. And I think that I've actually spoken to an Italian about it and she says, basically, it's not really been dealt with. It's been kind of sort of swept under the rug. And I think that that's the way they would prefer to keep it. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I've just got a few other little bits of relief, but uh, you can, you can kind of see this stuff that's on here. It's, um, you know, there's interesting that there's St. Mark's line um, and allusions to kind of George and um, George killing the dragon, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I thought this was, this was kind of interesting. This was like a um, uh, like a big mural on the wall. I, I'm not sure if it's a mosaic or not, but this is on the side. I don't know if it looks like a mosaic, doesn't it? Yeah, I've got, I've got, it's, it's, it's uh, on on one of the walls of these other buildings across here. Uh, okay. I can't find it, um, but uh, you know, I was, I, I was mentioning around how kind of uh, I feel like there's a definite kind of Soviet connection. This to me feels like a large Soviet, um, you know, piece of propaganda art. But instead of having kind of like the focus on, um, you know, kind of science or kind of like the woman and work, there's something kind of like, like yeah, reactionary about, about it. It's a, it's a little bit strange. So you've got the kind of professions of art and you've kind of got almost these kind of muse-esque figures who are depicted in um, um, 
in, in a modernist style here you can see you're going to got the kind of uh, music and uh, you know the p painting just uh, justice here with the, with, with the weighing scales um but i I thought it was interesting to see the kind of similarities between this and you know what's going on in um, Lenin, Lenin's. Uh, well, I guess it's Stalin, Stalin by now. If it's but what what interestingly, what you also find is you'll find this in America at the same period. Yes, because yeah. as part of the New Deal, uh, you had the Works Administration Project um, set up by um, Roosevelt in the 1930s and this was basically designed to keep artists employed because and also because the middle class had been basically hollowed out by the depression there was no art market so what roosevelt said was okay we'll get artists to work and we'll get them working on public projects so they're going to be um, painting for airports for post offices for um, train stations and so forth so you had a massive mural uh, painting project which employed thousands of artists across america and you find stuff like this where it's sort of civic in some sense but it also includes some uh, elements of modernism. I mean, especially this this happens particularly with the murals that Arshail Gorky did for um, an airport, a particular airport. Couple, I can't remember which one it was. Uh, so maybe it was LaGuardia. But um, um, but anyway, you can't really you can't really paint an airport uh, with sort of <laughs> classical figures and illusions. No. You've got to have you've got to have some sense of modernity, some sense of excitement, some sense some reference to electricity and uh, aerodynamism and so forth. So anyway, you get you get sort of their own versions of this in actually in um, uh, in the USA and there's still some today. And uh, anyway, I mean that's that's a different subject, but yeah, I mean that's uh, a brown uh, a strand of civic art that you'll find in America. If yeah. um if if we've included this in the in the list ahead, then s um stop me. But um is is this not slight that point about like uh you know covering the airport with you know classical uh figures and illustrations? Is it does it not sort of hark of that um metro that Stalin builds in Moscow? That's sort of like this this really uh heavily. It's like neoclassical yes, yeah like yeah. steeped in ornamentation and bronze and you know like all this uh you know like like something it, it's, just, it's romanov it's called romanov style it is it's the yeah. late empire style which he resurrected mm -hmm. which stalin resurrected for the stalinist period yeah. which i don't know if we can cover or not but um yeah so the, the stalinist period involves a revival of the Belle Epoque, the the Romanov style, yeah. uh, the late imperial style of mm -hmm. Russia, and you can see this in the metro station. The metro stations are in many different designs. So there's one that's in Egypt, ancient Egyptian. There's one in uh, imperial <laughs> Russian. There's one in sort of Art Deco and stuff. I mean, these are amazing, amazing places. Mm. As as AA would say, uh, based style in at it again. I, I was literally going oh, to. Yeah. I was going to say. I was going to say that. It's, yeah. a meme. it's a meme. It's a meme, though. We don't really think he's based. Um, no. Well, yeah. I, I think I, I will say about Stalin what Berlusconi said about Mussolini. He had, he had some good qualities. That's. <laughs> and, then, um, and then, and then, and, and does um, um, Diane Abbott said about Mao? He also had some good aspects. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, he he did a lot of very bad things, and and he was a, a tyrant. But you know, he was he was a he was a he was a fine poet, and he did some interesting. Political things in the modern world, I think. You, uh, you wouldn't have all of those great Warhol pictures without him? No. There you go. No. There you go. Absolutely. <laughs> there's, I think there's, there's, what, Panama's, Panama's digging himself deeper and deeper in. Yeah. Just, just I, go, I, just I, I don't see how far I can push it. But anyway. It, uh, <laughs> but we, should we should definitely do one on, on Stalin, though. We haven't included it mm. today, but um, maybe for part three. three. Um, j just going on back to the, the mural a second, one, one thing I quite liked um, um, from a symbolistic point of view. Again, you've, you've kind of got, uh, again, allusions to Roman um, grandeur with the kind of use of the eagles. Uh, and again, following on kind of with, the, with those ideas of Roman culture, you've got the kind of masks, which are obviously would have been worn as part of all of the um, plays um, to kind of hide the actors. Um, but you've also got kind of more more modern symbols here. I don't know if you can see this in the background, this mysterious shape, but it's, it's mm. an abstract figure of the fasciés. So I've got, of course, the fascist oh, is, course. Is, is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is, is the symbol of the uh, fascist movement, which is a kind of a bundle of sticks mm. with an axe attached to it. And it's something that um, 
you and know, the, 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 the fasces the fasces are actually the 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 bindings around the outside which turn the weak rods into a strong unit mm -hmm. exactly mm -hmm. um but I, I just quite like how they kind of in, intersperse this kind of subtly in the background you know it's the it's almost here the the, the fasces supporting justice itself yeah. across there i actually I, I i really like i love when people are able to to boil down um sort of fairly like i, I know i know that the, the, the fascist is not like a very complex image but you know a, a, in effect quite a complex idea or kind of symbol and take it to its absolute minimalistic end and i i'm not saying that 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 should be what we strive to do but i do th I, I i do find it interesting artistically when people kind of experiment with that you know sort of how like how how minimalist can you make this symbol? And you see there, it's literally just sort of like an upside down H. <laughs> it's uh... yeah, it's 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 almost like a, a form of branding in some ways. Mm. But again, it's it's very clever. And again, I think there's something. This is this is where I feel like the the modern right has lost all of this. It's lost lost the idea of you know we often talk about oh yeah culture is important, but I think most modern right wingers don't understand like the the well, there the is no there is no coherent. There is yeah. no coherent sort of right in that sense. There, there, yeah. there, there, there does need to be this kind of uh, um, artistic advance, I think, or, or just some way of uh, building something without just say, being like sort of a, a trad larper. You know, we we just want to re re return to X or return to Y. Um, mm. I think I think that it, it is up to people in these communities who are kind of artistically minded um, and have a, you know, serious ideas about where, where to take art to push this forward. Um, yeah. Um, okay. I've, I've got a few other bits from bits of sculpture from here. And I, th I think it actually, interestingly for me, the sculpture is the, by far the weakest part of this. So for example, mm. you've got, uh, you know, generic classical chap by horse. I, I, what I hate, I just hate this across here. So ob obviously, um, if you don't know, it's quite difficult to support that um, horse, isn't it? Su support a horse, <laughs> and so certainly in in the Roman schools, they would like ha have people leaning against various bits and bobs. Tree I mean, stumps this, this, are very favourite. Yeah, ex yeah. yeah, exactly. Or, or, you'd, can, or you'd have little, or you'd have little sort of uh, supporting characters just happen to be leaning against their leg. Yeah, yeah. Conveniently, exactly. the, the horse is re re rearing over a bush or a hedge. You know. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, this is terrible. It's literally the, the guy's armor across there. So yeah, mm. not, but it's, it's it's interesting. All of the, all of the actual sculpture I find to be you know pr pretty weak. Again, this this is kind of interesting where you've got the kind of pugilist. You can see his boxing gloves across here. Mm -hmm. So if you have, have you have you guys seen the boxer that the kind of famous bronze? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's kind of allusions to that. But it, he's again doing the Roman salute there. But he's he has a youthfulness to him as well. So it's yeah. almost kind of like. We we are the kind of new boxer. I, I should maybe I'll bring it up. Um, not in a second. Sorry, I didn't I didn't plan this. A yeah, boxer boxer at rest. I always think that there's something definitely melancholy about uh, about the boxer, um, and obviously he looks old and tired. And so I think mm. there's something. something and he's, he's got his, and he's also he's got the broken nose. So you know he's been he's been in a few fights. Mm. There you go. Yeah. Um, I think, I think he's also got color. I think he's also got cauliflower ears, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, Welsh I mean, this, rugby this, player look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is this is really a, a a brilliant masterpiece. But this is this is one of the better pieces there. But um, again, he's he's kind of wearing the, the wreath of victory. So I I do wonder whether this is a reference between the two pieces. Although again, it does show how they're kind of a little bit prudish still, where they've got kind of like the uh, the fig leaf over there, the genitalia there. Mm. Well, uh, you know, I think I think the guys totally need there you go. <laughs> yeah, because much, 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 much more sad, much more sad. Doesn't doesn't care. Somewhere, he, he, somewhere. He is, he's like he's like the Chad meme, isn't he? That profile. <laughs> he is he's kind of like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's sort of wizened Chad. <laughs> um, yeah. So again, again, there's these kind of our allegorical figures, but they're they're not they're not that good at all, in my opinion. But um, there we go. So, th so that's the um, e U R or uh, uh, plaza. But we can continue on. And th and here we have a here we have a painting by Giorgio de Chirico, who we saw at the beginning. 
This is uh, his gladiator painted in 1975. Wow. Just three, just three years before he died. He died at the age of 90. And he lived most of his life, uh, the later part of his life, in Rome. Uh, so he was in Rome, I think, all during the Second World War. And so here he is. And of course, does the architecture look familiar? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. So this I, is so so this is basically him inspiring Italian fascist architecture, which then went on to inspire him again as a painter. So it's a really interesting sort of uh, sort of baton, uh, you know, sort of relay race with <laughs> him uh, forming both the beginning and the ending of the influence. Yeah, it's it's interesting because he's almost taken that shape and wrapped it around like you're in a Colosseum. So obviously it's kind of mm. all, all allusions to the gladiator and there is something kind of like... Um, Cirillo data data about it, isn't it? But, uh, yeah, because uh, uh, um, metaphysical art was one of the prime inspirations for surrealism. Surrealism started in 1924. It was a fusion of sort of inspiration from metaphysical art and Dadaism, um, Dadaism, which had sort of begun in sort of 1915 or so in the Great War. And um, De Chirico was very interested in blending, uh, he was both a modernist and a classicist, so you see the, uh, the the segments of classical pillars in his uh, in his midriff. Um, the the legs are um, uh, écorché. They are stripped down the way that you have in anatomy books. You have in Vesalius, you have the stripped down to the musculature, which helps um, anatomists and artists to understand the structure of um, the figure. And of course, you've got the Roman uh, the Roman gladiator helmet on the floor, on the ground. You have the Italian, the Italian sort of Roman or fascist architecture in the background. So this is really a sort of um, De Chirico sort of playing in a way that sort of pre prefigures postmodernism. So postmodernism is the way that you would adopt motifs and styles from different periods and combine them in a sort of way that undermined and questioned the languages. But here, I think this is sort of. Um, Obviously, that's bedeviled with sort of um, triviality and uh, irony and general sort of silliness. But De Chirico avoids that. So um, just just on that, because um, 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 well, I used to just... pass that every day on the way to work. <laughs> yeah, I, I I was quite shocked seeing this the first time. But, that's but now a listed. That's now a listed building. That's number one poultry. Yeah, it they're, it can really sneak 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 up on you. You know, <laughs> if you don't know it's coming. Also, you should see the building you replaced as well. It's a real it's a real tragic loss. But there is something Italian fascist about it. I, I do think. Do you know what I'm saying? Because the, the postmodern uses a lot of the um, certainly British postmodernism uses a lot of the kind of Roman Roman arch. And can you see mm. across here that that kind of T total yeah, square, square, um, square, square column, column, square yeah. column. All, all I'm saying, all I'm saying is this is a fascist, <laughs> fascist building. Anyway, let's. Uh, um, anyway, so, me, yeah, this, so, so yeah, well, there you this are. Cool this, this, this is kind of like a bit of like a self-portrait. I wonder. Mm. Um, you know, this is the th these are the things that make up make up make them up. But anyway, should we go on to the? Uh, this is some, this is some German stuff now. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I don't know how far we can. I mean, I don't. It's up to you how how far you want to get into the German stuff. If because obviously, I don't think we're going to be able to fit it all into one stream. Yeah, you know what? Is it okay if I we switch across to some more Italian stuff that I've got? Yeah, um, it's fine with me. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to talk about another couple of um, things that, w that that went on in terms of kind of exhibitions. The first one um, I've got was one of Mussolini's most famous and pop popular ones, um, which is the um, the exhibition of the fascist revolution. So he, he um, kind of pulled it together in about uh, 1932. Um, and it's kind of, uh, so obviously this is about, was it 12 years they've been in power for? So he's had three terms and he wants to kind of highlight, um, like, again, it's, it's interesting how they're kind of creating the myth of fascism. We saw we saw where that kind of um, Trajan column esque um, relief work. They're trying to um, you know show their place in history, if that makes sense. And as part of that, again, they're kind of building out this um, this idea. So I think what's interesting about this is this is the fascists getting together and trying to create um, 
a visual story of their of their movement. So, mm-hmm. like I said, it was opened opened in thirty two. Had over four million visitors, which again at that mm-hmm. time would have been a, a huge number of people. It was it was considered Massive a huge, success. yeah, a huge success. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's a really quite spectacular um, series of series of rooms. Um, now, w- one thing I, I just wanted to kind of show you the entrance way. I've managed to find some. Um, um archive footage of the building of it across here just to give you a bit of a 3d flavor of what the front front was like uh maybe i'll turn this maybe i'll turn the sound off but uh, you can see it being built across here but um th- there's something unbelievably modern about the the frontage but also what do mm. we notice what are these four things across here at the oh, front yeah, it's got the axes uh, it's it's got the uh the oh. fashes again Again, the the creativity, you know, it, it's it's really rare to see. And again, I know that this fascism really isn't like right wing in the way that you know it, it's 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 revolutionary, not reactionary. But but still, it's it's interesting to see a kind of rightist or at least anti liberal movement, you know, with this much kind of artistry involved. This this, this is the sort of thing that 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 kind of has a legacy and captures hearts and minds, you know. And, and again, just imagine you're kind of li- living your little tiny trad life, and you're seeing these gigantic four gigantic <laughs> uh, fasces appearing out of nowhere in the sky. I, I think it's a very impressive. That's just the frontage. Mm. Now, now, when you go inside, oh, yeah, here's another a, sh- a shot of uh, yeah, various people outside. I just have lo- love just how like low energy these Italian soldiers are as well. <laughs> you know what I'm little parade. Yeah. Um, and this this is kind of the the, um, the inside. So it's kind of like a museum, um, but I, I think it's basically unlike any museum at the time. But it's very like museums nowadays. It's it's very strange because uh, again, if if you compare this to photos of like the Br- British Museum or um, like any UK museum, um, it's we have this kind of like much more um, kind of collector and uh, we group stuff in a very specific kind of way. While this is almost like um, Soviet photo montage, you know, or like they're trying to put loads of stuff together, but this, this could be done in, in, um, in the seventies or the eighties, or if you go to the Imperial War Museum today, they've laid stuff out in a similar way. But again, mm-hmm. look, look how, how they've used kind of like gigantic flags in, in, in the center across here, the use of font all the way through, and um, the image, uh, the the imagery is all about uh, again motion, um, action, um, war, and and the kind of power of Italy here. So yeah, here's the section. Here's the transport. It's quite and, marvelous. Uh, it's it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty cool cool exhibition actually. Uh, again, look how they've got the kind of cranes disappearing off into the distance, but then they've pulled it. I think this is the first one's done in 3D, so it kind of punches mm, out. More. It's a relief. It's high relief. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then they've just painted on the, the back one to give you that kind of sense of draw, drawing mm. you in. But then again, it, uh, you can see the ship across here. There's something almost Art Deco about the, <laughs> the kind of ship. Yeah, I was, I was going to say the, there's, an, there's a really strong Art Deco uh, influence on, on the exterior and on the poster and yeah, and the typography. Of course, also th- some of this comes from Bolshevism, the, the sort of the early... Yeah revolutionary posters and so forth yeah that, that, that's it I, I think there's definitely something about that um yeah something soviet about, about it at the same time so it's also interesting now i, I will and i was trying to get this lined up but i found this most excellent uh, video which in it, 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 um italian kind of breaks down all the different rooms if for some reason that the it's it's not uh okay maybe it's going to work now but they kind of analyze everything and um i'll, I'll send it around after the stream but it's really clever to see the symbology that they use in the room. Like they'll they'll put silhouettes of Mussolini's face into the different spaces. Again, the use of can you see the hands there? Mm. Um, th- those are like a hundred hands coming out, but they're all in the shape of the Roman salute at the same time. So again, it's kind of like you get that feeling of the crowd, but there's an, uh, a facelessness to it as well. So again, uh, aligning with. Um, you know, fascist ideologies around. You know, you're becoming, you're, you're becoming almost nothing. You're absorbed into the state. You're, you're just a, a floating. <laughs> you're just a floating hand to the state. Yeah. I, it remind it reminds me. Contrast this. They've got so many ideas. They've got so much action. They've got so much energy and vigor. And you compare that to the debate over the Millennium Dome. <laughs> and we built the Millennium Dome for the year 2000, oh. and we didn't know what to put in it. We didn't have anything to put in it because no, no. one could agree. 
Hmm. We should we should do an entire stream on the Millennium Dome because it's just so <laughs> great. That, that would be yeah. brilliant. It, it, it's a hell of a story, isn't it? You know, it, uh, the, the the whole thing around that. Um, having, having shuddering, shuddering yeah, backwards to the wind, shaking, shaking hands with Tony Blair. Oh, <laughs> singing old lang side. Oh, so, 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 so cursed. Um, now, interestingly, around um, uh, around you know the people they got involved with this, they had uh, Mar uh, Mario um, Cironi, Enrico uh, Prampoloni, uh, Gerardo D uh, Dottori. There's basically like ton, tons of artists involved as part of this. And again, you've got to remember, step back a second, this is meant to be like a history thing. This is a museum, but they've taken art and placed it right at the center of their kind of cultural projection. So it, it's very interesting. Just one other thing to, 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 you know, we talked about the intellectualism of the Italian fascism, which I also think is interesting, is that in 1925, they actually created a manifesto of fascist intellectuals, which then tried to amplify and um you know m uh you know try and connect with intellectuals and also artists at the same time so again it's interesting that so early on that uh Mussolini was trying to connect with look, he was trying to intellectualize the whole thing as opposed to sorry sorry it, if i put it the other put it this way we heard we heard from hitler he is trying to do a bottom-up movement of you know the the volk versus you know mm. Cringe art. Mo mod and and modern and he and obviously the modernists were obviously characterized as um bolsh actually it's, it's worth mentioning the the aa me recently mentioned uh he wanted to know what kind of books were burnt in the famous uh, book burning in 1933 and i can tell you yeah. what kind of books they were because i researched this for my for my fantastic book uh, iconoclasm um which is available from all good bookshops and uh, websites right uh <laughs> I so I looked at this and the, the type of books that they were burning was they were burning actually sadly a lot of manuscripts but some printed books as well and the sub and the so it broke down into subjects and authors so this often overlapped but the subjects that they disagreed with were obviously Marxism, Bolshevism, anti-patriotism, anti-German uh, subjects. Uh, the so-called Jewish sciences, such as uh, psychoanalysis, sexology, so the scientific study of sex, and uh, Einsteinian physics, um, and so that, and they're obviously they were also going for um, authors who overlapped with those as well. So it was quite it was quite a range, um, and. So yeah, so sorry, any sorry. So those were so those were the um, the sort of the prescribed categories. Um, it's all, we'll talk next time about, about the, the German attitude towards degenerate art. But I think in Italy, I, I don't think there was. It was just so much not that you didn't get official favors, you didn't get official commissions. But I don't think there was anyone specifically sort of banned from creating in the way that there was in. Uh, Germany. No, and and I think of course in Italy there was an act there was an active interest in modern art. You know, the, this is this mm. kind of new because as I said, they wanted to actually take the society forward. They wanted to build something proper. Whereas in Germany, they just wanted to sort of larp about being, you know, uh, Wag Wagnerian uh, uh, Teutons. You know, and, and this sort of thing. <laughs> it was, it was. Um, Except when it, it came was, to the autobahn. Well, you know how <laughs> how how artistic is the autobahn? You know, <laughs> well, yes, obviously, is it? in construction projects, yeah, but obviously not. No. Yeah. Um, j j just just on that as well, it's also worth note, like, uh, worth worthy of note that they created um, the uh, Acad Academia d'Italia, which again is another like artist group, but that was state backed. So I, I think, like you said, that their approach was very much we're just going to fund we're going to fund people who bend the knee and join our um you know new kind of like art, art academy basically so it's kind of mm -hmm. like it's it's kind of genius because again you don't have to do anything negative you just got to starve out everyone else and then they'll yeah. go, and, and, there's go no, and there's no and there's no racial qualification as well in italy remember yeah exactly interestingly um obviously um uh, marionetti um you know the futurists started uh you know if you read the manifesto it's, it's relatively anti-government i would say there's something almost a anarchist about it mm. but he too bends the knee to ashes italy um are you, are you ready I've, I've managed to find um <laughs> you, 
his uh, his eulogy to Mussolini. You ready for my ita- ita- terrible p- poetry reading? Here we go. Uh, okay. <clears throat> the Duque up close. The Duque radiating power from a solid elastic body, ready to be detonated, weightless and spontaneous. A continuous thinking, willing, deciding. That's it. But there you go. Mar- Marinetti composed various bits of poetry to for Mussolini himself as well, which doesn't, mm. which gets, which gets missed out on uh, the discussions of the future. So, I, which, which I thought was in, interesting as well. He also um, just sort of a random thing. He he has some of the greatest poses ever. If you look at his pictures, <laughs> the, like he 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 knows how to pose for a photograph. That man. Spe- speaking of that, I, I've also got. Oh, in fact, just I, I just want to talk about one other exhibition as well. And it's this one here. I don't know if can anyone recognise this room. Oh, is that is that the Nash, or is that the Royal Academy? That is the Royal Academy, and I don't know if you can see across here, Donatello. I don't know if you know this, but um, um, in the oh, the the Italian, the the touring Italian art of Renaissance. Yes, yes. So basically, the uh, Royal Academy got approached by Mussolini to put on an exhibition of Italian art and they created a, a very famous exhibition called the Exhibition of Italian Arts 1200 to 1900 where they basically shipped out some of the best stuff. So again, you've got Donatello's, you've got um, Raphael's, you've got um, Titian's were there as well. It was really like a tour de force of the best art. Um, and um, head of the list of the show's honorary presidents is a one Benito Mussolini. So there you go. It's the uh, ah. he, he was very well regarded from what I from what I've heard in, in circles. So th- this in, was part, in, yes, in this was part of the, the propaganda campaign. The, the idea yeah. that Mussolini was appropriating the culture of the Italian Renaissance to show that he was the inheritor and that he was he was sort of sharing it with the world and promoting Italy on the world stage as a cultural yeah. leader. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think it's really fascinating um, kind of use of art as a weapon. Because again, uh, you know, who doesn't want some beautiful Renaissance pieces? Um, now, just 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 as an aside, uh, apparently uh, Kenneth Clark was a member of the British Executive Committee for for this show as well. So wow. he he literally signed off <laughs> signed off an exhibition with Mussolini there, which he he then later um, disavowed in the seventies. Oh yes, I'm sure he did. <laughs> Well, yeah, also- there, there was, it was yeah, it was an uneasy, it was an uneasy alliance between people in the art world who wanted to get stuff done, and and mostly if you have your, if you're an artist and you had to make your living, and you had to join one of these sort of unions, you have to join one of the unions in order to exhibit. I mean, what what are you supposed to do? Are you supposed not to sell art? Are you supposed not to? Where are you going to get your money from? If you're banned from teaching, if you're banned from exhibiting, what are you going to do? You're going to work in a bakery or something. No, it's, it's, you, you do feel for people, you know, if you just want to get on, don't you? And uh, yeah, you, you just want to, you just want to eat, eat, eat. So, but, just, um, um, it's, it's, sorry, no, go on. It's all right. Well, all I was just saying, just the last thing on the, this exhibition is obviously it's, but it's up to 1900. So again, it's not just about this kind of forward facing fu- uh, futuristic art or the more modern art. He's also cunningly, cunningly using traditional art as part of his kind of uh, toolkit of culture that he, he's trying to weaponize. So internally, it's about the future, creating, um, uh, um, you know, building, almost building the fascist brand through through art. But then externally, again, it's trying to show, just like you said, Alex, I think that's a great way of describing it as he is the inheritor of um, the Renaissance itself. Sorry, sorry, Panama. Well, no, well, it was kind of a uh, almost a, a change of topic, but there's a question from uh, Matthew Daniel in the chat uh, who asks, how do you folks feel about the Amber Room? Do you think it will be lost forever or could some billionaire be hiding it in his basement because he doesn't want it destroyed further? Just curious of, uh, about you refined folks' opinion of that room. Mm, yeah, so this, so this is the Amber Room. It's created in 1701 for the Charlottenburg Palace in Berlin. Well, that's actually Potsdam, Berlin. Um, but it was uh, in, it was installed um, in the is in the city palace, Berlin city palace. Um, and it was looted, I think wasn't it looted by the it was looted, it was looted by the Ger- looted by the Russians. 
Oh no, sorry. German soldiers um, disassembled the Amber Room, uh, mm -hmm. and it was sent to East Prussia for storage. And then what happened was, I think that the Russians got hold of it. Yeah. Um, my my feeling is that. Uh, I think that something this large and this delicate, I think, has probably been destroyed. I think that it was it was it was on one of the trains that was bombed or derailed. Uh, I think that uh, I think that it's gone. Sadly, I mean, yeah, it, it's it, you can't really, I suppose, lose something of this scale, can you? You know. Um, yeah, and like also, a, although, although actually it's, it's, a, it's a good point because there is some art that the Russians looted from the Germans, which they were, which they did agree to. Well, they, they they changed tax, so sometimes they said they agreed to return them because this was part of the, the Hague Treaty. The Hague Treaty says that no um, no victorious nation can plunder the arts of the defeated nation, uh, but then they also said, well, we need it as reparations. So they flip-flopped, and there are a number <laughs> of, as the Russians do. Yeah. So, so, the, so the Russians do have a number of masterpieces that originally came from Germany, some of which were taken from France. So you've got yeah. some French masterpieces which, which were taken to Germany, which were taken to Russia, still in Russia, and are in mu Russian museums to this day. Now, obviously, the plundering thing we'll get to, I think, in the next session. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, also, I just love that I didn't that tiny Putin across there. Just loving yeah, it. There he is. Yeah, that's a re yeah. We have to point out that's a recreation. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, of course. But, <laughs> um, no, interesting. And thank you for your question. Please, more questions. We always appreciate mm -hmm. them. I, I was a bit worried if that was uh, taking us off topic, but I just thought because uh, someone asked a question, we should probably. Yeah. Uh, no, it's a good that, question. Yeah, that was that was that was that was brilliant. So, uh, so I love so this. this. So for this next section, I've got a couple of um, depictions of Mussolini um, of, of various kinds, some self-sanctioned. But one of the most famous pieces is uh, this, which is known as the continuous profile, um, obviously, of Mussolini. And you can see here, you can see his forehead, nose, lips, which has been kind of spun around in, in mm. 360. So um, obviously, he came to become prime minister in 22 uh, and the continuous profile was made in the um, year 11 of his uh, reign. And apparently it was super popular and was cast in a number of um, um, materials and sizes. And it would be sort of commonplace for households to have a, um, you know, one of these on your mantelpiece or on, on, on your side. Um, but j just as an art piece itself, I think it's really interesting because there's, uh, again, something, you know, this is tied directly into futurism where, again, you've got kind of depictions of things in motion. There's also um, traditional elements to it as well, where you can see uh, the god Janus, who is, he's, he's the god of the new year and also like death and life. Yeah. Um, and he, he kind of looks forward to the future, but he looks back to the past at the same time. So again, the, there's that kind of interesting um analogy between what, what Mussolini was trying to do from a fascist perspective, where he's trying to look to the past, but also look to the future. There is this, um, uh, you know, energy to it. There is, it's, it's almost shaped like a bullet, bullet though, as well. There's something quite aggressive mm -hmm. about, about the, um, the shape and the design. But uh, I, I think it's a really interesting piece of uh, like popular art. I, I was thinking either, I was thinking either lemon squeezer or sex toy. <laughs> this 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 wouldn't be out of place in like a like a Stark or a, like a nineties. Uh, <laughs> uh, you've lost, the, you've whatever, lost yeah. your train of thread now. I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. Disavow, no, disavow, yeah. disavow. This is very. This is oh, very. Well, this is, this uh, is the one thing that Panama disavows. Yeah, I disavow that. This is this. I I think this is actually. I mean, like, it's it was literally when I when I first saw this, it was kind of like. Con a conceptual revolution in my simple mind you know it, it was like i i it, it had never occurred to me you could you could do something like this you know you could capture somebody's likeness in such a way um so this this always has quite a high uh high place in my heart i suppose um you know i i just i'm yeah. just a big fan of uh of this sort of thing what i think is really clever as well is that i think the italians um recognize the importance of the the silhouettes and mm -hmm. um, if, if you see in all of their poster art, it's all about showing off 
um, the chin. You know, like I think I think what's funny about Mussolini is not 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 you know I wouldn't describe him as a good looking man, but he's got a very but, distinct, he, but he was iconic face. Yeah, 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 you don't I, you don't I, have I think, to be pretty. You have to you just have to have a face, you know, that really sticks out with people. And I think that's not something that Hitler really suffered from was where he, if you did a profile uh, of him, if you remove the moustache or you didn't see the moustache, mm. I wonder if you could tell who it was. Well, I I, I was reading some time we're going back about seven years now. I was reading a book about him, and apparently part of the reason he cultivated that. Look of the of the uh, the the the, uh, the tash and the sort of sloping hair um, was because he wanted to kind of ape after Lenin, you know, Lenin's very iconic bald head and, and beard, you know, uh, that that was what he was aping for. So, I mean, and 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 again, this 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 bust it it goes back to that thing I was saying about how I'm very appreciative of of artists who are able to take the most minimalist essence of what they're trying to depict and. And with as little physical matter as possible, get across the object without losing anything vital, you know? So, again, that's another reason I, I like this sort of thing. Just just on that vitality, it has this kind of, like, stony stoicism mm. to the face as well. Do you know what I'm saying? He's not uh, angry or sad. He is just, like, just there, which, again, sort of ties into the material oh. choice as well, the kind of heavy, oh. heavy earthenware. Hello? Hi, can you hear me? There was some interference there, uh, but I think you're back now. Uh, sorry, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't hear the, we didn't hear the last, last thing you said there. Um, uh, no, I, I did. I think, I think you just, you dropped out. Oh, it was me. Oh, it. sorry. Yeah. Um, Alex, do you have anything to say about uh, this part from? <laughs> no, I think I've, said my, I've, I've said my oh. piece. I've, okay. I've revealed what a, what a shallow person I am. <laughs> Sorry. Um, now I'm going to ruin Ooh, everything. That's a painful one. I, I, I'm going <laughs> <laughs> to ruin um, this this great piece of work. Now, does anyone want to guess who this person is in profile? I'm quite, I'm quite worried now because. I actually don't. I can't see. I, I'm I'm worried that the only reason that other one worked was because I knew it was Mussolini. Uh, is it someone wearing like a, a, one of those sort of rice paddy hats? <laughs> it does look like that. No. Yeah, his, his hair is quite famous. Oh, is this, this is this Hitler then? No, this is Donald Trump. This was a this is a parody no. that oh, made recently. God. It's literally called like a continuous motion, continuous profile of Trump or something like that. It's literally oh this come is the, on, this cursed liberal arts. I just it I doesn't just even look like him. Up. Yeah. It's very, it's very, very weak. At least, I, at, at least the Italians had, you know, skill and artistic talent, <laughs> unlike whoever made this. You know, if you this, this doesn't. This is what I was saying. That bust captures Mussolini's profile very well. This doesn't capture Trump remotely. You know, so it's not. It's not meant to. It's meant to, like, you know, show him as the shouty man. Do you know what I'm saying? It's, oh, it's, it's, it's just. Okay. It's just. But it's interesting how. Um, it's a again, statement. Uh, yeah, well, that just aren't, aren't being used for propaganda purposes. Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, uh, it's the way that um, postmodernism uh, adapts itself for pastiche and parody. Mm. Um, okay, uh, the next one I want to talk about was this this very famous image. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've seen this before, but this is um, a bit of a meme, isn't it? It's a bit of a meme, but also I don't know if you know about the background behind it because I, I, I spent quite a while trying to find out. Um, you know, what is the reason why there is a, a C behind it? All well, the C's means mm -hmm. yes. C. Yes. So basically, this this was actually created for uh, an election that Muslim was running. I think his third election, and this is on the fascist party headquarters at the time. And you can um, apparently, so it was a free and fair election, it, it, but it was heavily fortified. Let's just say <laughs> mm. um, where <laughs> you, you're saying there was malarkey involved. <laughs> Uh, there was definitely malarkey where <laughs> you, you could vote, but you could either vote for the fascist party and or not. And what's even better than that, the the yes for for the fascist party, um, your vote had the colours like your voting slip was the colours of like the Italian flag, but then Amazing. the no the no was on a, was on a white piece of paper. I, mean, I just I just I just love that as a you power. either vote for yeah, Italy or you vote against it, yeah. or, or you vote yeah. for surrender. Exactly. I mean, like, it's it's so crooked and so, like, I don't know, 
bare face, but there's something admirable about it. it's some it's just it's, it's such a power move, you know. It's so it's so flagrant. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So it's it's brazen, but um, I mm. I think it's so again. So, so the yes is, is alluding to when you're handing in your um your vote, make sure to choose the right thing and make sure to say yes on it. But, um, I, again, I think there's something just something very otherworldly about uh, again the use of wordage as pattern, and again that there's um. So, you know something very original about that um done, done in that kind of way which is then you know again if, if we're going back to the idea of branding again you know louis vuitton or other other brands which kind of repeat you know they're pulling straight from this playbook basically well, louis vuitton probably un- owns that building oh, yes. now <laughs> uh. they, they, they probably did their pattern beforehand but um <laughs> but uh again this idea of repetition you know how like the you know left twitter likes to kind of repeat the same four or five things over and over again or whatever mm-hmm. um it, there's something about that but again just just the uh unmovable face here you've kind of got this um <laughs> sculptural head where it's very kind of planar you know quite cubist but again, Mussolini's he's almost been abstracted into this kind of like floating godlike head that's kind yeah. of observing everyone. But it's, in, it's, it's, it's sort of in, indifference. It's like you can hate him, but he just doesn't care about you. Do you, you know what I'm saying? It's not an angry or a commanding. It's just like an eternal quality to it. This is this is such a plebeian thing to say, but I, I, all I can I, I'm very much reminded of the computer from Red Dwarf. You know. The one with the floating head. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, Holly, that's it. Mm. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I mean, this this is the party he- headquarters. You said, isn't it? Um, this building. Yes. Yeah, in Rome. Yeah. There's um, I'm it's it's reminiscent of uh, I don't I don't know if you caught the Spanish Civil War stream um from the other night. Um, I'm ha- halfway through, but Karen, sorry. I uh, I I only caught a, a small part um because of the internet trouble, but uh, basically, I think that. Uh, somebody mentioned at the start of that a man named uh, Gil Robles, uh, the Spanish right-wing leader. Um, he had a similar thing to this uh, to try and win an election, um, where it was an enormous board in Madrid with his face on it, um, and it's and it had a slogan. It was something like he he, he didn't go for something quite this avant-garde, but it was uh, "Give me an absolute majority, and I will make Spain great," uh, or something like that. It, you know, this very kind of modernistic and, and and funnily enough it, it was actually the the right-wing catholic parties not not the left-wing parties in spain um that used modern forms of advertising they would purchase um they would buy airplanes so they could like just chuck huge numbers of uh, pamphlets out of them over <laughs> over spain and you know they, they would use radio they they even had a a very very uh sort of experimental for that for the for the 1930s van with two screens on the side that was sort of like inwardly projected so that it was like these two enormous screens of the, of the, of the Gil Robles uh, speaking, you know, which, which was really quite, quite something in that era. Um, and they also had uh, hot air um, dirigibles. They would fly, they would fly over this, over the sky at night um, with uh, it, it sort of illuminated flags and slogans and things, and you know, mass mass newspaper and advertising, and so, I, you know, it's it's again, it's I'm interested in historical instances where the where the sort of right wing has taken the lead, it has taken the offensive, it is playing the gambit, it is not just responding to what the left is doing. Um, so I suggest people look into that as well if they're interested in that. I need I need to get into the. Uh... The niche of dirigible advertising, based it's on that, it's quite as well. wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> balloons in the sky with uh, big flags. Cool. Um, so I, I just want to do this this next one, uh, and this kind of uh, ties into a uh, like a, a modernist school called uh, Aeropitura. I don't know if you guys have heard of this before. No, I think it's come up. I think it might have come up in a previous stream where we did political art, and you, you talked about. <laughs> Uh, futurism in that stream uh, and so in Italian fascism yeah yeah so, so it's all about kind of depictions of um, the aircraft and the um, and planes basically so again I, th- I think the one we looked at was like a plane dive bombing yes um, that's right the city yeah the, 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 the city but um, what I thought was interesting about this is again um, the kind of depiction of Mussolini here 
so so again that there's something um just in terms of the pose if if you go if you know much about roman sculpture they go through like a couple of different phases where again there's the kind of initial just copying the greeks but then they go through this kind of like brutal um realist phase where they go where they have these kind of you know in some ways kind of quite ugly but um you, you know i don't know how to we we need to invent the word where it's kind of like the aesthetics of a really ugly or like gnarled man but he kind of looks brilliant at the same time because he's obviously just been so hardened with time um but again um Mussolini here has has, a, has that pose you know it's not necessarily mm. that flat flat flattering uh, again they've kind of slightly you know t- you've got some facets around his cheekbones here and his nostril where again they've kind of modernized it a little bit but um you, you can see here as uh, you, you could interpret this in a number of ways where it's like Mussolini is is the kind of aircraft flying over but also you can see kind of the Colosseum this is obviously Rome you know Mussolini is Rome this this is again going into ideas of uh, the fascist state absorbing everything and being uh, part of uh, everything but again it's, it's almost like a silhouette again you know it's his eyes are hollowed out you're just seeing that kind of that famous shape but um yeah quite an interesting piece i thought uh yes i'm i'm sorry i'm i'm looking something uh i'm looking up something but yes i, I completely uh i, I yeah, think uh, it's it's again i i think it's it's i think mussolini was aware i mean he was not trying to look like a pretty boy you know he 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 wanted to just have this very kind of stony faced almost like easter island head level kind of uh <laughs> yeah you know uh just stony that that kind of fixed will that 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 resolve and of course to us now he may he may appear sort of clownish but I think at the time it, it did go a long way to keeping the Italians going for that long, you know, and let's, let's not forget he ruled the country for 20 odd years. You know, this was not a brief reign as, mm. uh, as, as, as essentially the complete uh, ruler of, of Italy, you know, whatever he said when. It, it, interestingly, uh, I think sorry, I think... just, just sent you a link by the way. Uh, interestingly, I think there could be parallels between um actually Churchill as well um, and depictions of Mussolini. I don't know if it's intentional or, or not. Possibly. But, but when you see a lot of his sculpture, they do they, they do something very, very similar as well. Yeah, that um, sort of scowling, sort of quite chubby. Ex- uh, exactly. It, yeah. It's just it's just the head and, um, you know, nothing nothing more than that, basically. Right. Can you see this? Yeah, so, so here is an image. So this is something, this is sort of the ambiguity, playing on ambiguity. So you've just had that image of Mussolini as a, as a sort of a cityscape viewed from the air. Here you have painting by Salvador Dali painted in 1935. And what can you see? Cheeky Mussolini. Well, That's great there. Is it Mussolini? Well, there's no. Actually, there's, a, there's, a, there's a face on its side. Yes. Be, yeah. So yeah. what what you've got is you've got a combination of an African. It was taken from a postcard of an African village, and if you turn it on its side, it's a it's a it's the face of Mar- of the Marquis de Sade. It's an invented portrait of the Marquis de Sade, uh, the the eighteenth century author, um, sir, adored by the surrealists for his orgiastic depictions of. Um, Sadism, well, sadism, basically. We could, we could, we could possibly do do a stream on him alone, uh, you know, in, yeah. in terms of his influence, at least. Uh, and so this is, yeah. So this is a combination. So this is something that was being done at the same time by Salvador Dali, uh, obviously a surrealist. Uh, so this is 1935. That's interesting. So in terms of like again creating the silhouettes, trying to create the kind of iconic head, um, yeah. I think this kind of early modern period is there's a definite rec- recognition as to yeah like how to sort of work out the personality cult, um, and you know obviously this is going to inspire um, loads and loads of other re- revolutions down the line because you, you sort you sort of get that with Lenin a little bit, but I always got the impression that there was loads of Lenin statues created during st- the Stalin period. So mm. I, I don't know. If, yeah. I don't know if it's, um, I, I don't I don't know who kind of really worked it out first, but. Um, 
you know, I, th I think the Italians definitely went pretty big on, um, you know, those, those kind of depictions. So um, I've got just, just uh, two, two, two last ones and they're both posters here. And this is, um, again, one, one other kind of symbol of um, Mussolini is, again, his pose. We saw that on the horse, but him kind of standing up with the riding boots, with his arm on his side. And then again, the classic different array of Italian. Um... He is kind of Chad. I, I, I have to give it to him. Like there is something, <laughs> there is something. There, I, I just, I, in comparison to what we see around us today. Yeah. I really, I really admire this like completely unironic, just forthright, like screaming at the crowd. It's like, here's what we're going to do. I'm here to like grind some heads together. You know, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, and again, I think it's it's interesting because I feel like he's almost a bit of an actor as well. Did did he have like a history in acting or something? I have, I have a very recollection or something. Well, uh, he was a politician for most of his life. So yeah, journalist. He was a journalist. He was a novelist, and yeah, no, not but, not but, acting per se. But I th but it, it, maybe it comes from rhetoric. Maybe it comes from yeah. You know. Well, I mean, I but uh, what I was trying to kind of hint at there was that you know being a politician is acting in a sense, isn't it? You know, you're always playing a part yes. of the crowd. Um, and something, just something very odd about Mussolini, but just before I, I forget to mention it, um, uh, at some point prior to his rise to power, he was actually a school teacher, a, a, a school teacher of very young children, I think about eight, eight, eight years old or so. And he was completely, he couldn't control the class. They, they just ran over him completely. He would sort of like cower and shake in the corner. <laughs> um, while this class ran amok, and he he used to sort of timidly offer them sweets if they would just sit, you know, sit down for the remainder of his lessons and and listen, you know, and it and and in in mockery, this class of school kids used to call him um, tyrant. I can't, I can't remember what, what the name for it in Italian is, but you know, they used to call him the the, the tyrant because he was so uh, in, ineffectual at uh, at running the school class, and it's just it's. It's just, it's always been a fascinating thing. You know, how, how do you go from that to this in this picture? You know, I'll, I'll tell you how by buying AA's foundation. I knew it. Rate. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> I should get paid uh, for that plug. And, I'll, and, I'll send and, and getting, sure. and getting that, you to design the posters. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Farah has uh, a, might, might have, a, might have a, a, a stake in this. <laughs> maybe. I have actually got some poster designs for the for uh, foundations actually in general, but uh, we'll, we'll we'll see. And it's a work in it's a work in progress. But um, again, again, there's something definitely like almost theatrical about this, though. Is, is what I was trying to say. And, and mm -hmm. again, it's interesting hearing hearing that. Like he obviously is just not like you know maybe maybe he changed in his life, but not necessarily a natural natural uh you know a natural chad <laughs> to go back to your terminology but again he understands the importance of the silhouette and again harking back to the roman orator and the um the the emperor that everyone's listening to and mm -hmm. that's this is part of creating the icon part of creating the icon uh, iconography and the uh, the image um and then fi finally this uh, this one as well which I, this is another another poster again there's something about the head turned up as well we've noticed it, in, it it's, it's been in a few a few versions mm. wh which again is a little bit of a weird pose because not only is it very hard to depict i always find because of the foreshortening in the face it's it's not like a natural pose. You'd always either do like a profile or a three quarter view for a head to to, to make it look the prettiest and the best. Mm. And but the, like it, it always makes me think of someone like um, either Mantegna, who would always do these kind of weird, like uh, foreshortened. There's like what yeah, one of the Christ, sort of saints Christ with the upturned hand. head. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. Or maybe Tintoret, uh, Tintoretto, who would also put people in very weird poses as well to create these unique shapes. But what, what what you do is by lifting the head up, it's much harder to draw, but it creates a real dignity in, in the pose. Mm. So again, it's, it's interesting how even the pose itself, it's not just who he is, but just the posi just by lifting your jaw up, you can sort of like show who you are. And again, this idea of, uh, again, energy, verticalism, um, we're, we're moving forward. There's something about that, you know. You're looking up, up to the sky. Indeed. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And then, and that's kind of like echoed, but below where you've got these kind of uh, factories, far, you know, uh, with smoke. But maybe they could also be AA uh, anti-air guns firing up <laughs> AA guns. And uh, I mean, yeah, yes. I mean, look, 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 look. How they call him? Um, I, I presume that's 
founder of, of the empire. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, that's that's quite a bold thing to call him, especially when there's, you know, there's, there, there is actually a, a, a king of, of, of Italy, you know, <laughs> uh, while all this is happening, that he, he is he is technically the prime minister too. Well, I mean, um, they, 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 what the Italian empire was, what was it? It was Libya and Abyssinia, Ethiopia. Abyssinia, yeah. Which very nearly went um, tits up like the first one did. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it, it's, it's a shame that he couldn't sort of commute this uh, sort of art, art strength in, into his troops, I suppose. Um, or, or, or his own personality as well. I, th yeah. I, think, I think the the, um, the vision of Mussolini as he portrays himself to other people, um, you know, <laughs> was, was a... Was a uh, a false fiction ultimately but um yeah uh, i I, th I think that's basically it from uh from my side i don't know if there's a anything else you guys wanted to cover off tonight um or discuss no i, th I think i think that it's, it's probably best to leave it there because the the german stuff has got a different character um obviously it's more there's more we've got stuff to talk about the looting um the sort of the the iconography of uh, ruins and stuff um because so, the, the, yeah. the Italians basically and also, also to art. Either as well. yeah, it's 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 a very, it's a very different story, isn't it? If it, it feels like yeah. it's like the the um, Italians, it's intellectual, it's planned, it's with the existing, it's sort of jumping off the back of futurism and existing art movements. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, my, my my general viewpoint is, I think there's some very good quality art during this period of time, and and, and especially um, certainly on the graphic side. Um, and there's some novelties on the building side that there's that there's a lot of fascist uh, architecture. Um, and uh, if you follow my Twitter handle, I'm, I'll, I may send around I'll send around the, that uh, YouTube video of the exhibition and maybe some interiors from The Conformist as well, which is a, a film that's well worth watching. But um, I don't know if you guys have got any closing remarks on the Italians. Um, no. Saluto. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks for that, Panama. That's so, right. thank, 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 <laughs> thank you so much, guys. Um, yeah, like I said, we'll, we'll be doing part two shortly if we don't get banned from YouTube for Panama's various uh, phrases from tonight. Uh, but uh, I don't know if there's anything you guys wanted to shill at all that you're. you're well, you've, you've got to shill the channel. Come on. Hit that oh, like yes. button. Smash. Smash button. that like button, chaps! If you're if you're a a, a patrician of, of, of the Ferro Academy, smash that like button. Subscribe. Exactly. Tell all your this friends. Is, this is the future. You are on a dynamic plane to. Meet, I'm trying to see <laughs> futuristic <laughs> poetry <laughs> on this part. <laughs> you're so into. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, but please, please follow and and, sh and uh, sh share this round and. Um, uh, Alex, anything else you want to plug apart from the book? Um, no, uh, got two books out uh, which you can buy on various websites. Also, you can visit my website, which is alexanderadamsart.wordpress.com if you want to read some articles discussing fascist art, uh, Italian art. There's going to be this uh, review of Carino de Giorgio up very soon. Uh, also, I want to say um, the, the, the promise that I can still do... Um, Saffron's portrait reveal at a thousand subs for Pharaoh's channel is still open if um, if Saffron sends me an image to do. Um, so I've you, actually, have to, I, you have to have to sweet talk her. I, I've already started my uh, initial sketches for the, for 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 that challenge. So, uh, and we did we did pass five hundred the other day. So thanks for. I, I, was, I wasn't aware there. of this. It's, so there's a there's a portrait competition. Well, the, well I, I, I I promised to do a portrait of to do a portrait reveal of uh, saffron at uh, 1000 subs but um saffron has said yes but she hasn't actually sent me an image okay um, and, and i'll you, also be doing a piece of and, artwork artwork and, pa and panama can do it panama can do it a limerick there was i will, I will, I will come. <laughs> <laughs> well i think i'll have, 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 have avoid the limerick before it becomes offensive uh perhaps uh, perhaps <laughs> you, something you, a bit more classical you, you must do it all in saffronese though that's that, oh, that will be oh, no. that will be that will be the poetic the Ar challenge of my life. Who's oh, the not, Irish? Not, who's, who's what, the rhymes, Irish what rhymes with what rhymes with stibbers? 
Stib- Ch- uh, Ch- well, <laughs> well uh, Alexander Adams. I don't want to get Ferris Channel completely banned, so I won't say <laughs> what, what rhymes with Stibbers. Uh, <clears throat> yes. I think that's called half rhyme, technically. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you though, of course, it's because the language is so fluid. You know, it's it's a bit it's, it's sort of saffron patois. You can uh, you can play around with it a bit. So we'll have to see. Was it, is, is it uh, is it Dylan Thomas? He did Ulysses. Uh, that was uh, James James Joyce. Oh, jo- yeah, Joyce. There you go. Where it's basically like unintelligible Irish basically nonsense. Yeah. That's what I'm imagining for your. Your submission, but uh, there of, we go. That, that, that will that perhaps will, what, it, what, what it will be like. I'll have to write a sort of like ode to to, to, to the language, I suppose. <laughs> um, so there you go. If if you can get if guys, if you can get us to a thousand, that that will happen. We'll do a live a live review of that. But um, thank you very much for listening. Was there any other questions at all? Um, nope. No, uh, th- no that was the main one. Okay, just th- th- thanks for interacting, and remember to leave a comment because that helps the algorithm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Cool. And and with that, we'll say good night and uh, catch you later. All right. Cheerio. See you.